Hey everyone, it's Colin. How's it going? It's well known that through the 90s, laptops progressively got smaller and more portable, eventually spawning a new category called the subnotebook. But there was one manufacturer who pushed the boundaries harder than any other and incorporated some interesting technology in the process. This is a Sony VAIO PCG-U1. While it's part of the broader category of sub-notebooks, it's specifically been referred to as a micro-laptop, which is something Sony had a bit of a penchant for around the turn of the millennium. And true to that ultra-mobile moniker, it's so small it starts to blur the line between notebook and personal digital assistant. It's not really practical to use like an ordinary laptop, not only are its keys far too cramped, but its pointing device would be downright annoying. Instead, Sony intended it to be handheld, almost like a portable game console, and doing so makes the thumbstick and mouse buttons much easier to use. The stick itself is of the pressure-sensitive type, like the trackpoint nub seen on other laptops. Primary and secondary click buttons are on the opposite side, which unfortunately means that lefties like myself are forced into an arrangement we're not entirely comfortable with. In easy reach of your right thumb is a Sony hallmark from the era, a scroll wheel and back button to make web browsing easier. The U1 doesn't feature built-in Wi-Fi though, as that was still fairly new technology at the time of the machine's release in 2002. Of course, adding a wireless adapter could be done through the single PC card slot on the left side, which is also home to the audio in and out jacks. The right side has another common Sony laptop feature, a memory stick slot. For its size, the back panel is quite decently populated. 10100 Ethernet, 4-pin iLink, better known as Firewire, plus a pair of USB 1.1 ports and a miniature video out socket. It was a bit of a feat of engineering just to make this machine as small as it is, so it probably comes as no surprise that there is no room inside it for a battery. Instead, there were two options for packs that could attach to the bottom. Mine has the standard 1800 mAh lithium-ion unit, which is said to provide about three hours of use. There was also a larger 5400 mAh pack that covered the entire bottom of the machine and offered up to 10 hours. With a weight of under 2 pounds, or 850 grams, the handheld form factor actually kind of worked. Typing was still difficult, but Sony had a neat trick up its sleeve to help. A button labeled Thumb Phrase brought up a text autocomplete function that leveraged the keys on just the left side of the keyboard. Unfortunately, it only works in Japanese, though that's probably fair considering the machine was never sold outside Japan. The display on the U1 is rather nice. It's a 6.4 inch active matrix panel with an impressively high 1024 by 768 resolution, so it looks incredibly sharp. This did actually garner some criticism from Western press though, as text ended up difficult to read at times. Sony clearly thought ahead about this by including a zoom button on the screen's right bezel, but its implementation is a bit disappointing. I had hoped it would enable a dynamic zoom window you could steer with the thumbstick, but instead it's just a software toggle to change the resolution to 800 by 600, which of course softens the image in the process. It also wasn't really a gaming machine. It came with an ATI Mobility Radeon graphics chipset with just 8 megabytes of video RAM, and though the onboard sound used a Yamaha YMF753, it didn't seem to support hardware MIDI playback. If you wanted to play older games, you'd be stuck with Windows built-in software synth. This U1 came with its original Japanese installation of Windows XP Home, but its RAM had been upgraded from the stock 128 megabytes to 256, a bit short of its 384 megabyte maximum. 
This is done through a small panel on the bottom and uses micro dims, a somewhat uncommon form factor at the time, but necessary given the cramped internals. Another victim of its size is the hard drive. There's a 20 gigabyte ATA 100 unit inside, but it's of the 1.8 inch variety. These were notorious for lackluster performance. They were good enough when used in MP3 players like Apple's iPod, but in a laptop that saw much more frequent disk access, the drive made the U1 feel slow. What also didn't help matters was the choice of CPU. Instead of an option from Intel or AMD, Sony went with something quite different. The Crusoe from a company called Transmeta. Highly portable computing devices like Sony's UMPCs were the new trend for computing in the late 90s and early 2000s, but most CPU options at the time were either powerful but power hungry, or efficient but slow. Crusoe promised a balance of both, but in a very unique way. Instead of being yet another x86 clone CPU maker like Cyrix or Via, Transmeta designed Crusoe around its own custom architecture. But to allow it to run x86 operating systems and programs, the company developed a technology it called code morphing software. In short, this was an emulation layer built directly into the CPU that allowed it to convert x86 instructions to ones the underlying silicon could process. This could grant Transmeta and its customers tremendous flexibility. If a different CPU architecture needed to be supported, doing so was just a matter of updating that software layer instead of redesigning the chip as a whole. And perhaps most importantly, Crusoe was far less power hungry than the CPUs it emulated. There were some who heralded Transmeta's offering, such as Don Tapscott writing for Computer World in early 2000. Internet connected mobile devices were the new frontier, he said, and power efficient processors like the Crusoe were integral to their future. And while the concept of mobile friendly CPUs did make sense, the Crusoe specifically did not. At launch, there was skepticism of its capabilities. The code morphing technology was a novel idea, but as with any kind of emulation, usually a performance penalty was attached. As an industry analyst was quoted in InfoWorld, what would happen when a Crusoe was put up against an x86 CPU of a similar speed? An absolute bloodbath in the benchmarks, as it turned out. PC Magazine reported in early 2001 that a 600 MHz Crusoe-based Sony laptop was a third as fast as a Toshiba machine with a Pentium 3 of the same clock speed. Sure, it was argued the P3 was faster, but the Crusoe drew much less power, so battery life was better. The counter-argument, though, was that the increased battery life was meaningless if users were left waiting longer to get their work done. Crusoe ended up in a few different systems, like Compaq's TC-1000 tablet and NEC's PowerMate Eco all-in-one. And Transmeta tried again in 2004 with its second generation chip called Efficion. But it saw even smaller adoption, in large part due to competition from Intel, which had released low power versions of its mobile Pentium 3 CPUs. Transmeta's power efficiency suddenly wasn't quite so spectacular, and by 2005, the company moved away from CPU development and focused on licensing its technology instead. The PCG-U1 came with an 867 MHz Crusoe TM5800, but there was a higher-end model too. Called the PCG-U3, it was almost identical to the U1. The U3 had the same form factor, ports, and features, but came in a dark blue and black enclosure. Its key differences were on the inside. It stepped up to a 933 MHz Crusoe, came with 256 megabytes of RAM by default, and maxed out at 512. Due to equal parts scarcity and novelty, these machines are fairly collectible among retro tech enthusiasts. My U1 was not cheap to acquire. 
It cost me $245 US from Yahoo Auctions Japan, plus shipping and proxy buyers fees. Though admittedly, it also included a nice bundle of accessories. The seller had taken very good care of it. The only problem really was that the rubber screw covers on the display housing had deteriorated and been removed, which is a common issue with lots of retro laptops. There were two optical drives, a combo CDRW DVD unit that connected through Firewire and a CD-ROM that used its own PC card adapter. I was also given the original manuals and restore discs, especially useful since VIO machines are notoriously difficult to find drivers and software for. A spare 1.8 inch hard drive was even included, though I'm not certain of its condition. And rounding it off, the seller threw in a VIO branded USB mouse, complete with its packaging, and that Sony specific video adapter dongle. The U3 I bought was a vastly different story. It was downright cheap. I won the auction for only $30 US, going up against a few other bidders. But there was good reason for this. The machine was sold as junk, that is, for parts of repair, because its LCD panel had gotten cracked. It seems to work otherwise, so there's hope for this one. But finding and replacing its screen will be a project for another time. And as for another time, these machines really feel like they're from a different era, one that never fully took off. UMPCs existed in a niche that relatively few found appealing. They were bulkier and more clumsy to use than a contemporary PDA, but also far from ideal as a primary computer. In fact, Sony even advertised the U1 and U3 as being accessories of sorts to your home PC. And selling at a price of around $1,200 US, it wasn't exactly an impulse buy for many. But while they weren't the most powerful or even practical, these machines exemplify a time in technology that's seemingly long past. One when computers were truly unique. If you liked the video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on social media at thisdoesnotcomp, and as always, Thanks for watching.